our first presenter today will be Doug Leno. He's the industrial hygiene specialist with Average Liquid Pipelines Business and provides subject matter expertise in the fields of occupational health and safety. So what we move, um, in our system, our Line 5 system, we move primarily um, or exclusively light, synthetics, and uh, natural gas liquids. Um, you can see from the, the frequency distribution there, you know, about 20% of that is, is NGL, so I'll talk more about what those are. Um, and about 80% of that is, is lighter synthetic crude. Um, you know, varies on an annual basis, but but generally speaking, about 50% of the of that is is light, and about 30% synthetics. Um, and then, of course, again, 20% of that is NGL. So where it comes from? Um, so we have uh, six primary injection points along the, the long line five, um, or along the system that leads in line five rather. Uh, those come from uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Hardesty, Alberta. Robert, Saskatchewan, Regina, Saskatchewan, Cromer, Manitoba, and Clearbrook, Minnesota. Uh, we also have some smaller points along the way. In fact, there is one just south of here um, that picks up about 14,000 barrels a day from Michigan. So I'll get into the characteristics uh, of, of crude, and I'll start with sort of a higher level overview of all crude. Um, so crude is defined by its, its gravity and its sulfur content. Um, so this top figure you see here is defining crude by its API gravity. Uh, those being greater than 31.1 uh, is, is light, and you can kind of see on down the line. API gravity is a, is a relative measure. It's actually a unitless measure, uh, but it's relative to uh, the, the density of water. Um, so those being uh, greater than 10 would, would, are lighter than water, and those being less than 10 or, or extra heavy crude, as we would, have, we would call it, uh, would be more dense than water. Um, crude is also defined by its sulfur content. So uh, sulfur content greater, being greater than 0.5% by weight, uh, being classified as sour, and those being less than 0.5% by weight would be classified as sweet. So specific to what we move on line five, uh, the lights, the synthetics, and the NGLs, um, lights, uh, meet, uh, meeting the definition of, of uh, light crude, as I just mentioned, but light crude in its natural state, so um, as we pull this stuff, or as it is pulled out of the ground. Um, and the, the origins of that are Western and Central Canada uh, in the Bakken Formation here in the United States, uh, primarily. Um, synthetics, by contrast, are, are those that are uh, the equivalent of light crude, but those that are, are don't come naturally in the environment, those are actually come from the refining process. Um, and similarly comes from Northern Alberta, Saskatchewan, and other parts of Western Canada. Um, and, and NGLs, are, or, or natural gas liquids, um, are, are composed of the, the very, very light end hydrocarbons. So 
And what I mean by that is the stuff that tends to want to be in a gaseous phase, um, but, but, it, but it's still very much a liquid as we move it through our pipelines. Um, and its origins are Western and Central Canada. Um, I also listed across the bottom um, some of the primary uses, and I'll get into a little bit more in detail about NGLs, um, about what those are. Uh, but for the most part, refinery feedstock for our lights and synthetics. Um, and refinery feedstock just means that it's the stuff that goes into refineries to make, uh, to make other things, whether it be gasoline products, um, uh, diesel uh, fuels, um, plastics, um, you know, all the, the host of uses. Um, and NGLs, uh, uh, again, household heating, refinery feedstock, and gasoline. And I'll get into a little bit more about that here in the next slide. So NGLs, uh, made up of primarily six components, uh, ethane, propane, butane, ethane, natural gasolines, and condensates. Um, um, talk a little bit about those, the uses of those, but, but in order of, of lightness to heaviness, uh, lightness starting on our left and heaviness moving uh, as we move across to the right. Uh, ethane is, is, a, is a product that's used in refining, uh, typically chemical refining. It's, it's cracked to make ethylene, uh, and ethylene goes into uh, production for plastics um, that uh, have a multitude of uses. Um, propane, obviously, the, uh, most of us know what that is. That's the stuff that we use for, for heating oil in our homes. Um, Butane used for, also used for, for home heating purposes, um, but for the most part, uh, butane and isobutane um, used for gasoline blending, uh, uh, household products, heating, refrigerants, and things like that. Um, pentane uh, used for gasoline blending as well, and uh, chemical refinery <laughs> feedstock. Uh, natural gasoline is obviously used for gasoline production. Um, and condensate, uh, which is used as a diluent for, for heavy crude oil production. So I, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about some of the, the governing principles of, of how, how crude oil uh, acts in the environment. Um, so this is sort of the what happens if uh, scenario, and this is specifically driven uh, for, for the area that uh, that we're talking about the Great Lakes here. Um, so, so what happens if, if a non-heavy conventional um, product reacted in the unlikely event of a spill? And it would really depend on, on several key factors, and, and that's, uh, um, you know, obviously these, these change with time, um, so, so, but we'll talk about temperature, suspended sediments, um, and weathering. So, uh, Temperature uh, obviously plays, a, plays an important role. Um, NGLs, as I mentioned, uh, uh, are both very light in hydrocarbons and tend to want to uh, uh, be in a gaseous phase. Um, so for the most part, we would expect under most uh, normal circumstances that NGLs would dissipate as a gas. Um, in our light crudes, uh, we would expect them to evaporate up to about 30%. Um, and the remaining would be expected to be, remain buoyant, uh, as this is a, uh, uh, a crude type that is lighter than uh, water. Uh, but of course, there are there are things that play into it, such as suspended sediments. Um, so, if in the unlikely event of a spill, uh, if suspended or if crude was to move into an area of suspended sediments, like in a, a, a river mouth, for example, or more turbid water, um, it has a tendency to adhere itself to to sand and particles in the water, and it uh, makes it want to sink. Um, and weathering, of course, uh, that's, the, that's what happens if crude stays in the environment for longer periods of time. Um, and oftentimes, it's very long periods of time. Um, and what happens is the, the crude characteristics change. The chemical and physical properties of the material start to change. Um, um, in most circumstances, we're talking about uh, non-heavy, light crude products. Um, in, even in the event of, uh, of weathering, we would expect that our crudes would stay uh, buoyant uh, because of the nature of the crude. It is a light product that moves through fine. Um, but it, of course, uh, in, in rough cold water, it could tempor temporarily submerge and then resurface as water would calm. Um, but there may be some emulsification and things like that that happen with the rough waters and the you know, slapping of waves and things like that. So I'm going to uh, stop there because I know that we want to have uh, lots of time for, for discussion and dialogue. Uh, it sounds like we're going to uh, hold questions until after Ralph uh, speaks. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Ralph and then, and then thank you again and I look forward to lots of good discussion here.
Thank you.